Yes, as you, as you said, I've been living in China for, for just over 20 years at this point in time. And uh, when I went there, um, one of the, the privileges that I had was to, to try and create the, the consulting industry in China. Because actually, back in the early 1990s, consulting wasn't legal in China. Uh, although we hadn't bothered to check that before we showed up. Um, and so we had to find out uh, how to, you know, how to, how to, how to uh, register a legal entity, how to do it uh, without creating a joint venture, because for, for better or worse, McKinsey doesn't do joint ventures. Um, and then we had to work out how to explain what we do, not just to potential clients, but to future colleagues. You know, at that point in time, everyone graduating from the university got a, you know, encouraged position to go work for, for the government or go work for a state-owned enterprise. So we had to get them to step out of that. Uh, and one thing you did become was, was actually pretty good at describing <laughs> what it is that, that, that McKinsey, McKinsey does. Uh, and I think, you know, a lot of what I've done over the last 20 years is about building a business myself, not just advising other people on that. Um, what I wanted to, to talk about today was, um, you know, where at this point in time, you know, I see, you know, the economy uh, heading overall, and then push down a little bit into um, where we might see the next, the next wave of opportunities, because certainly some industries are actually getting relatively mature in China at this point. And the number of industries that are about to go through the inflection point, the S-curve of you know, four or five years of 50 60% growth, where just being in the right place at the right time is the key to success, um, it's going to be a new set of industries uh, over the next, next four or five years. Um, so what are the key, key elements in, in the trends? Um, you know, clearly, you've got to frame you know, what, what role is the government playing? Uh, and certainly the consistency of purpose around a push towards domestic-driven growth, consumption-driven growth, services-driven growth is there. And it is happening, but it's happening slowly and steadily. Uh, and given how dependent the economy has been on infrastructure, it's not going to change overnight. The other thing that I think I would just highlight from the government's actions at the moment is you know, the, the anti-corruption um, initiative is still going strong. Uh, and I think it's certainly in terms of the uh, local level government officials' conspicuous consumption, it's a fact of life going forward. No one expects that, that there'll ever be a return to the era of very high level conspicuous consumption by local government officials. Um, and that does create some interesting challenges down the road because, of course, government officials get paid relatively little. Um, and therefore, you know, the relative attractiveness of being a government official is diminished in the same way that the relative attractiveness of being a teacher, relative attractiveness of being a doctor in China has become very low over the last 20 years um, because <laughs> those jobs used to have enormous status uh, and in a society where in income levels for everyone were low, uh, that was great. But in a society where the, the, the sales agent coming to the hospital to sell the drugs gets paid three times what the doctor gets paid, you know, why would the doctor be the doctor? Um, I'll talk a little bit about um, the middle class becoming the mainstream uh, and, the, you know, and how that is continuing to drive overall consumption. The fragmentation of urban markets. Um, what that means for businesses is um, you know, an ongoing process of cost increases and margin pressures. Uh, and so we see much, much more focus on, uh, to use the broad word, productivity. Whether you're a multinational, a private Chinese company, or in many ways, most excitingly, state-owned enterprises actually care about productivity now. And really, they never have in the past. Um, digital, um, the pace of digital disruption in the economy in China <laughs> is, if anything, faster than we see in the West, whether it's the, um, well, particularly in the emergence of, of online retail, 
and what that is doing to disrupt uh, physical retail. And as I'll touch on, in some cities, you may never get modern retail as we've known it. I mean, the malls haven't been built, and they may never get built at this point. Um, local innovation. We are seeing a tipping point in a number of industries, and I'll highlight a few. Um, you know, solar energy, uh, wind farms, as wind turbines, um, medical equipment, um, where you're seeing genuine innovation by Chinese companies today. Uh, and then I'll close with, you know, a little bit of, of what could go wrong. Um, you know, I think on balance, we're continuing to, in all likelihood, have a 6 7% growth year. Uh, and, and, but there are some discontinuities that could come there. Um, out of the plenum, the, I'd say, first, first and foremost, actions from the plenum last year have actually been pretty slow in implementation. Um, and we hear a lot about the, the new authority and, and strength of leadership of, <coughs> of Xi and his team. But there's still a lot of checks and balances, particularly when it comes to dealing with the economy. Um, and so while they've, they've moved on the market mechanism in terms of raising prices of a lot of utility inputs, energy, water, land, capital, minimum wages, um, in terms of streamlining relationships, in terms of actually introducing more private capital, that's going very, very slowly. Uh, very little has been happened on that. In terms of the urban, <coughs> urban, property, uh, urban resident, residential rights for um, citizens from the countryside, also going very slowly in terms of pace of change. Um, this slide just illustrates where we're headed um, with the evolution of the middle class. Um, and, you know, by the, <coughs> the, this is why when some, some product categories in China, have the, you know, the, the cognac guy is probably the most extreme. You know, they've seen 60, 70% reduction in demand as a result of the anti-corruption. Mercedes has continued to see double-digit growth. BMW sees double-digit growth. So cars, cars are being bought by the middle class, vast, vast majority. They're not being bought by, by government officials. And it just illustrates the strength of consumption power <coughs> of this middle class that's buying the homes, often buying mm. multiple homes, buying cars, buying the iPhone. I mean, Apple now sells $25 billion of product in China to Chinese consumers. Um, up from, by the way, almost zero four years ago. They only started to take the market seriously after Tim Cook took over. Um, <laughs> but the, the, the depth of consuming capacity in the middle class there you know, is very, very strong and is the, the most important underpinning driving the growth of the economy going forward. But is the, the pivot on that is it's a, these middle class consumers lose confidence if these guys lose confidence, they could easily pull back the spending. And remember, there hasn't really been a recession in China for more than 20 years. So you have to be 40, 45 to have experienced a recession while you've been in the workforce. Um, and you know what many government officials are so hyper-concerned about is overreaction from unsophisticated consumers. And you see this all the time, in the, whether it's the, the reaction to wealth management products and defaults, whether it's reaction to a, a fear of drop in housing prices. And so the, the government is very much framing its actions around how do we sustain consumer confidence? And at some point, this will become a, difficult, you know, a very difficult pressure to deal with. Um, Moving in, <coughs> the middle class, the, those middle class folks that I've just been describing, historically were, you know, predominantly in the tier one cities that we tend to visit. Uh, but, you know, looking forward, all these, the new, the new citizens coming into this class 
are in the Tier 2 and Tier 3 cities. Yes, they'll still largely be coastal, you know, within 500 miles of the coast, um, but it will be another 60 to 100 cities where these citizens are. That creates a lot more complexity in building your business uh, and, 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 and running your operations in China. I mentioned earlier that a lot of industries are growing a lot more slowly. You know, the golden era of communications, of, you know, steel production, <laughs> of chemicals and the like, is past. These are, these are yes, they're, they're still growing, and maybe, you know, by, by European standards, these are nice, exciting growth numbers. But by Chinese standards, these are very mature industry growth numbers, six, seven, eight, anything that's single digit. Uh, and this is where, you know, throw money at the problem, throw people at the problem no longer works. And so they're having to become much more sophisticated uh, in, in how they operate and um, bringing in a lot more international talents in many ways. I touched on the pressure um, that we're seeing in terms of, you know, water, you know, real estate, wages. Let me just touch on, 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 on wages because in many ways there's... there's there's two wage economies going on in China today. Um, there's actually a shortage of skilled factory workers. There's a shortage of skilled factory workers. So you know, even as the government pushes up the minimum wage, it actually not, doesn't have to push very hard because pe factories are having to pay more just to find people and attract them. Um, the sec but the second, wa second wage phenomena is for university graduates. University graduates in 2014 are getting paid the same they were paid in 2008. In fact, may actually be getting paid less in 2008. There's 7 million graduates a year. There's maybe 1.5 million get jobs that require a being a graduate. It's five million of these folks that are coming out of university every year and are really struggling to find a job. They end up in call centers. They end up selling insurance. They're insurance agents. <coughs> uh, very high level of frustration. And in fact, the, the, the wage, wages have crossed over. If you're a skilled factory worker, you will get paid more than one of these second tier graduates coming out doing a white-collar job. Um, but there's a prestige problem. It's graduates can't go work in factories. Uh, <laughs> that's a pressure that's building up in the economy, and it's certainly one of the things that, that concerns me and that I worry about. Um, as a result of these increased costs, profits going down. I just wanted to, to sort of bring, bring that to life. We're still in positive territory, but your typical state-owned enterprise is about... 40% less profitable than it was three or four years ago. E-tailing, um, what's going on with, with e-commerce? A um, cu couple of examples. If you live in a tier three city and you've got income um, and you say, I want to buy you know, a branded handbag, a coach handbag, there is no coach store in that city. The department store doesn't have it. You buy it online and it gets delivered the next day. And <laughs> that's how you become accustomed to buying your luxury goods. It's how you become accustomed to buying all of your electronics, you know, your, your, your clothing. And <laughs> now in the first tier cities, it's how you become accustomed to buying your groceries as well. Um, I'm not gonna claim I'm typical, but you know, we don't go to the supermarket anymore, everything. Gets, you know, from, and it's not just from these mass market. There's all of these niche online players too. So it can be from the online, from, from the organic farm, delivering directly to your home. Um, the convenience factor, the comfort factor, <coughs> is just really, really, really high. Um, and even there's a couple of other things that are going on with this. The um, the economic model of running a mall in China is typically you take a percentage of revenue of the stores that are, that are in, your, in your mall. Um, so the customer comes into the mall, has their mobile phone, they look it up online, <laughs> they, they try it on there. 
Um, they may just order it online. There's nothing much you can do about it. But you may actually find that the store has iPads or tablets in there and says, why don't you order it online rather than buying it from, from me? Because it's actually a higher margin for the retailer to have you buy it online than buy it in the store. So, you know, Burberry's is a great example because they explicitly do this. And they, you know, so they're now, you know, essentially under the old model, they're getting, they're renting their space for free because they have no revenue in the store. It's kind of interesting dynamic. Um, the second thing that I'd really highlight is the cross-border aspects of this. You know, what Alibaba and JD uh, and others are doing, 60% of small packages going into Russia are Chinese e-commerce sites shipping products into Russia at this point. Um, Southeast Asia is starting to see the same thing. You know, the Chinese companies have set up local language websites, <coughs> Alibaba, JD, and the others. They're doing it in India now. <coughs> and they, they, they've, got, they've got the logistics infrastructure and the cost structure in the supply chain to fundamentally disrupt retail in Malaysia or Indonesia. And the like. I actually think we're going to see some interesting geopolitical challenges with this going forward. Um, I talked about innovation. Um, biotech, you know, these, these Chinese companies are staffed with um, PhDs from, from MIT, from Caltech, <coughs> and the like. They've come back, they've got, they've taken advantage of the availability of enormous amounts of funding to back them in China. They've got world-class research facilities, and the, the ability to test drugs in China is actually a very benign environment. It's very easy, to, if you're a Chinese company, to bring, to bring drugs out into the market to test uh, and do it at a pace that you just can't do in the US. So you're seeing new cancer drugs, um, you're seeing new diabetes drugs, which is a big problem in China, coming, coming to life. Seeing innovation in a lot of these medical products. New Soft you know, started as a supplier to Philips. Um, started as a supplier to Philips, worked out that of these medical devices they were manufacturing, they were, they were actually, they were contracted to develop the software for Philips medical devices. They realized over time that 90% of the value add was in the software. So they actually just flipped it around and started getting someone to manufacture the devices with their software put into it. Uh, you know, very competitive mind ray. <laughs> you know, billion dollars uh, competing in the market. This just brings it to life a little bit in terms of market share. The orange is the share of a whole set of different, different markets that are now captured by Chinese. Um, <laughs> and, you know, see the MRIs, um, you know, implantables are the stents that you put, 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 put in, into, into your arteries uh, and, and the like. And basically, if you go into a hospital today in China, um, you know, the, the, the doctor will ask you, do you want the premium or do you want the, you know, the, the mass product? And the premium will be the, the J&J, and the mass will be, be the Chinese. Uh, and the <coughs> share, is, share is growing, and they're, they're quality, reliable products. What do businesses worry about in terms of doing China, uh, do, operating in China? Yes, clearly, everyone worries about competition. Um, multinationals worry a lot more about costs. Um, <coughs> and Chinese companies are rather more optimistic so that they can, they can manage the costs. But the two down here, the ones that said this, the Chinese companies are really struggling with, my customers are getting much more sophisticated. Historically, Chinese companies didn't value functional excellence. Trying to find the chief marketing officer or you know, chief branding officer or supply chain, you know, every, typically you would rotate around. You wouldn't develop a deep expertise. And if anything, what you wanted to be is the general manager of a business unit. That's, that's the definition of success in a Chinese company. And now there's a real recognition, which I think is fantastic, of functional excellence is really, really important. And it's starting with the need to understand the consumer the need to get information out of you know, what's going on on the internet and how do I deal with that? How do I bring some science into pricing? 
I mean, most Chinese companies have been completely brute force about how they deal with pricing to this point in time. What could go wrong? Touched on you know, a little bit as, as we're going through. This top left is really about students. If you ever go to any of these job fairs in China, they're incredibly depressing, incredibly depressing events. Uh, just the number of people that are looking for jobs that, that don't exist. On the banking side of things, uh, I think there's very little chance of a, you know, of a, of a banking crisis. Um, what I do think is there's, there's a very real chance of loss of confidence in a lot of the wealth management products that are, that are out there. Um, you know, some of that links to, to the internet folks and the pace at which they have uh, they've developed. Um, on housing, um, I mean, in many cities, there is no longer a true market for housing in the sense that um, developers, um, developers aren't able to lower the price. Uh, why are the developers not able to lower the price? <coughs> developers aren't able to lower the price because if they lower the price in a building where they've already sold some of the properties the people they've already sold the properties to come back and demonstrate and cause trouble, that they want, the re they want a refund, they want a discount down to the new price. And if anything, they want compensation for the fact that the value of the house has gone down over and above the discount. So you see developers holding the line on price. <laughs> and so the market is getting very, very sticky, stuck, basically. Um, and you see... You see many of the developers being very honest. The Vanker CEO earlier this week was saying, you know, I think the, you know, the era of making money in housing and property development in China is over. Um, you see um, others just voting with their feet of putting billions of dollars into property developments in Malaysia or coming to London or L.A., uh, and, you know, to me, the, the property developers ought to be the people who know best what's going on in the housing market. A gradual evolution of price is fine. What, what the, you know, what a, a discontinuity leading to loss of confidence, <coughs> that's the big issue that we would be concerned about. Um, and then, fine, this is more just the, the Beijing pollution issue. Um, that you know, Beijing isn't the worst city, but it is the most prominent city for, for pollution in China. Um, that, you know, I don't think anyone has any doubt it will get cleaned up over time. It's just a question of the patience of citizens um, for the, how long it's going to take. Um, and you know, of the three big levers, they've already pulled the, the easy one of buying out polluting industries. You know, there's no public number on this, but anecdote, just looking at the number of factories that are gone, anecdotally, people talk about five or six billion dollars worth of spending by the Beijing government to shut down steel mills in the surrounding province um, <coughs> oh, since, since it got so bad. Um, you know, upgrading the quality of cars, the quality of gasoline, upgrading construction practices, you know, that's going to take a lot longer. Um, so, again, I don't think that's, um, it, it, it just can lead to problem, problems of lack of confidence in, in Chinese consumers, a lack of willingness to, to live there, to work there, to study there. Um, I think I touched on the real estate and banking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it really does all come down to, to consumer confidence. Um, Okay, um, spend a couple of minutes on where I see the, the new opportunities coming. As I said, most of a successful Chinese economy going forward is driven by domestic growth, urbanization, urban incomes, what do households want. Um, a couple of critical themes supporting that then. One is agricultural modernization, land consolidation, uh, consolidation of land ownership, creation of scale farms that you can industrialize that you can invest, it, that it justifies having the basics of tractors, modern seeds, modern fertilizer, modern irrigation to improve yields. Um, and then you know, the, the finishing off of the 
city infrastructure, whether it's um, public, I mean, there's likely to be another 300 billion or so spent on city level public transport, trams, undergrounds, and the like over the next 10 years, uh, trying to make the cities more user friendly. Um, bring this to life, the, the left hand side is, is our sense of how the evolution of what of, of GDP growth. Uh, and get going, private consumption going from only 20%, which is ridiculously and unsustainably low, to hopefully about half. Uh, and the growth in services that comes with that. Let me illustrate a little bit on, on some of these, these industries. I mean, we talked about e-tailing. On, on protein, um, you know, China's protein consumption is growing 5% per annum um, on a per capita basis. Um, you know, it's still only 100 kilograms a year. Beef imports have grown sixfold over the last three years. You know, China's invested $10 billion in soybeans production in Australia, Australia and Brazil, um, sugarcane in, in Australia, <coughs> milk in New Zealand. One thing I did want to emphasize here, a lot of this investment, almost all of this investment, is by private Chinese companies. This isn't the state going out and saying, you know, we need to, you know, own cows in New Zealand. It's private entrepreneurs. Actually, it's some of my friends who become wealthy by succeeding in technology. They see agriculture as the, ne as the next technology opportunity, the equivalent of the next technology opportunity in China, that uh, feeding, feeding China's middle class in the way they want, with high-quality, safe, <laughs> food, food uh, and you know value-added foods. Um, so you know, buying you know apple farms in Oregon, buying uh, cherry farms in Chile, uh, fish farms in Malaysia. You know, a lot of this goes on below the radar screen because it's it's fifty million dollars. It's not the the ten billion dollar kind of investments. Uh, <laughs> a lot of it's going on um, until the Ukraine crisis happened. There was this enormous initiative to try and build a dedicated wheat pipeline, or wheat flow from Ukraine, growing it, put it on the ships in the Black Sea, have it come round to a dedicated port up by Tianjin and bring wheat into China. <laughs> That's off, obviously a bit off the table at the moment. Um, milk, um, milk, I mean, it will be another generation before the Chinese middle class trusts domestic milk again. It's not going to happen anytime soon. Um, but convenience, processing that, you know, the, the growth of chilled, the growth of frozen prepared foods, the growth of demand for food processing equipment is actually one of those industries that is on an S-curve right now. It's growing 25% a year, the demand for food processing equipment. Um, the um, logistics goes a lot with the e-tailing. Private education, you may not really, I mean, China, private education is actually enormous in China. In the pre-primary, in the, in the, uh, pre more, more places are private than state-owned. Um, there's the tutoring side of things that's, like in all parts of North Asia, enormous. Online learning become very, very large. And private universities uh, is an established part <laughs> of, the, of the Chinese education system. Um, private healthcare. There were 1,500 private hospitals opened in China last year. 1,500 private hospitals opened last year. Uh, this, this, this is a classic uh, of Chinese government saying, we need to improve the performance of our sector, so we open it up to private participation. We open it up to foreign participation. You know, you, we could all go open a hospital in China today, 100% foreign owned, no problem. Our big challenge would be getting any doctors to work there, but um, <coughs> the, cause there's a shortage of, shortage of doctors. Um, but assuming we could, we could run that and we could run clinics, you see everything from, you know, the boopers, the Chinese, the, the American hospital chains through to private equity playing in this space right now. Uh, and my guess is, this will run for three or four years. And then China will say, we've got enough investment. Thank you. Um, we don't want to wipe out the domestic guys. Um, <laughs> and it'll move forward. 
and we will probably at that point have oversupply. And it may actually be quite unattractive for the foreign investors at that point. Um, if, you know, I wouldn't be investing in the hospitals right now. I, pro I might invest in building the hospitals, but running them would be, <laughs> is, 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 is likely to be relatively low returns unless you're careful. Tourism, obviously people have more time, they're traveling uh, dem domestically, um, the demand for, for tourism is very high. Um, you know, we were talking earlier around, you know, how, how do you stimulate demand for uh, Chinese tourists to come, come, come visit Ireland? Uh, you know, first, second, and third would be direct flights. You know, the reason so many Chinese go to Istanbul is not because they have a great passion for Turkey. It's because there's direct flights. Um, and there are, <laughs> this passion to go to different places, to go to new places, is really, really high. And if you can enable that, um, and it doesn't have to be from Beijing or Shanghai. It could be from Chengdu. It can be from Guangzhou. Just, you know, uh, it makes an incredible difference. Entertainment, when, you know, there's about 1,000 new cinemas opened in China every year. Most of them are very luxury, high-end. You pay $15, 15 US dollars, to go watch your 3D movie in IMAX in China. It's the second largest movie market in the world at this point. Um, <laughs> So there's, a, there's, a, there's a lot of money. Again, just the, the, you know, Disney's opening the theme park in Shanghai next year. Just the general th theme of middle class, demanding middle class quality kind of services that we're all familiar with, that many Chinese companies are actually struggling to, to, to de develop and deliver at this point. Um, just to, I'm almost about to, to, to close, but there's just one industry that I just want to highlight. When, if anyone ever asks, you know, if anyone ever says, says, says to say, look, no one makes any money in China, just remind them about the automotive industry. <laughs> the short version of this is one third, one third of the global automotive industry profits are made in China. And if you're selling luxury cars, it's almost half of the global industry profitability is made in China. Um, <laughs> it's been a fantastic decade if you're BMW or Audi. Um, I guess at some point this is likely to end. Um, but right now, they're making $30 billion of profits in China. I talk more about consumer than industrial. Um, Opportunities for industrial tend to be less at this point because there are many, many of the more mature sectors. Uh, the, the smart cities, I think, is still there as an opportunity. Working with and helping, partnering with Chinese companies as they glo go global is an opportunity. Uh, and at some point, the, the privatization wave will pick up again. Local governments need to you know, monetize the assets they have to pay down debts. Uh, and some of the, the remaining assets they have is less and less land and more and more businesses. And so they may not be particularly high performing. Uh, and you'll have to be selective and thoughtful about how to participate. There's, but there's a lot of both Chinese and international private equity looking at those opportunities at this point. <laughs> So that's where I'd like to, to close the, the sort of the, the summary and then open it up for, for questions and conversations. You know, net, net, I do think, you know, the base case we should all have is the economy will continue to grow at the 5 to 6% a year going forward. I do think there's some stresses that are building up uh, because of the, the government's avoidance of taking bolder actions that could... Um, reduce the confidence of the Chinese middle class and, and the consumers, um, and that at some point that's going to hit, doesn't create a bit of a discontinuity, but that's likely you know, quite a number of years down the road. So thank you. Mm -hmm.